All right, you guys. So the reason I wanted to bring this up is I have a few questions and we are relating this topic to the Idaho 4 investigation, which of course, if you know us, is Brian Koberger, the criminology student. Um, and uh, we want to dig into the possibility of there being police corruption. Now, it's interesting because, you know, There's a lot of topics out there that get labeled tin hat topics because they don't seem very likely, okay? Here at Thought Riot, though, we don't want that to deter us from covering these topics, digging into it, finding out information, and seeing if this can hold water, seeing if it can hold weight on its own, seeing if it can stand on its own two feet. So, do police plant evidence? Is this something that actually happens? Is it? Is this something that police do for a specific reason? What is that reason? Hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Could it be happening in the Idaho 4? I'm not a person that's willing to jump off the cliff headfirst. Uh, into a theory, idea, or opinion if I can't find anything to back that, you know? And even if we have evidence to back this, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's happening in this case. Mm -hmm. You know, a few videos ago, we were on a debate, you know, talking back and forth about the possibility of the FBI being corrupt in this case and how... I wasn't willing to uh, look at that without evidence um, and, and didn't think it's very possible. And, I mean, your your opinion was very similar. You're just more likely to believe it based on some of the past evidence, which there isn't a right answer there, you know? Yeah. Um, so I went digging. I wanted to know how easy is it to find details, evidence of police corruption and police doing this? And I got to tell you, I I expected to find some. I, I knew I was going to, but the amount I found was insane. I was not expecting that. I did. I, I, ex- I expect that. It, it was an insane amount. Now, I'm definitely going to be honest about everything here. There were a lot of situations where when I was doing research, it looked like It could have been corruption, but then they were able to prove how it wasn't type thing. Like Hmm. what I mean by that, here's an example. Uh, There was an LAPD officer and they got pulled over and they took one person out of the car and did a search. They pulled a baggie out of his pants and threw it in the car. Um, Well, the other people in the car were recording this and said that cop's throwing a bag in here uh, to set us up. But, and there was body cam footage from the other officer that's in the back. One, there was nothing incriminating in that bag. Yeah. And two, it came out of one of the people in the car's pocket, and the officer was throwing it back in. He said, yeah, I just pulled it out of his pocket. I'm not going to hold it. So not corruption. You know what I mean? So it's important to look for these things. But there's a lot of valid, real, legitimate corruption. Well, that's where body cam saved a police officer. Agreed. Body Body cams are good for everybody. There's this idea that the uh, the community that bleeds blue, you know, for the police officers, that it's like an invasion of privacy and when I hear that, I lose my when mind. You're it, an on invasion, duty, when you're on duty, you don't have that right. Uh, yes. It, there is no police privacy. They are ours. We own them. They are public servants. They are civil servants. They are here to serve the public. They don't deserve privacy in that regard. Not on duty. Not on duty. Nope. That job is not theirs. That job is ours, the people. And they've been gifted that job and have a duty to respect that job in the highest regard. So when we see issues here, um, 
And a good example is Baltimore. Baltimore is like the most corrupt police force ever. I think over half or like 60 something percent of them have been convicted and are doing over 10 years. Like the the amount of corruption in Baltimore was insane. But when you have that kind of corruption, how can you expect how can you expect the rest of society in the US to trust them? That it's it's hard not to, you know? And I we are gonna have a story in this podcast too that is highlighting really great police work. Cause again, I don't want to seem like I'm ever just attacking somebody because I'm pro police. I am all for police, but I also believe there needs to be oversight and accountability around it. So do police plan evidence? Okay. I have a couple examples here. 2015, North Charleston, South Carolina. Walter Scott was a forklift operator who had a warrant out for his arrest for missing a child support hearing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Michael Slagger was a police officer. When Slagger stopped Scott for a broken brake light, he found out about the warrant and moved to arrest him. Scott ran, and the two briefly scuffled. Uh, When the officer pulled out his taser, hit him, when it didn't knock Scott down or out, and he turned to run, Slagger pulled out his gun and shot Scott eight times. While Scott was running away. Oh, gosh. Now, the corruption part. I mean, that is corruption right there. You're you're not supposed to... You're only supposed to engage in gunfire if your life is at risk or somebody in the public's life is at risk. Now, um, Scott claimed... Or, I'm sorry, Slagger. Scott is the one who got shot. So, Slagger, the police officer, claimed Scott went to go grab his taser and his gun or both. I think a statement was both. Um, but there was a bystander. That bystander pulled out their phone and recorded the whole thing. So this is interesting here. This cop statement got him off the hook. Everything was cleared. The shooting was cleared, okay? The bystander that recorded this was terrified of what the police would do to him. So he held on to this for a while, ultimately giving it to the family of the victim, the one who got shot eight times and died. That family came out and released the footage and proved he was running away. He never tried to grab the taser, never tried to grab his gun, never tried to come at him. He was running away. Wow. Okay. Yeah, staging evidence, lying uh, on a statement, you know, that, that's awful. And this was just in 2015. <clears throat> now, in 1975, in Montgomery, Alabama, um, and this one, again, seemed like another open and shut case, but the police were searching the neighborhood for a suspect in a grocery store robbery, and they zeroed in on Bernard Whitehurst Jr. When they confronted him, Whitehurst reportedly pulled out a gun and aimed it at the officers. They returned fire, killing him with a single bullet to the chest. The shooting was quickly deemed justified when a gun was found at the scene. There was no autopsy, uh, and Whitehurst was quickly buried. It seemed like an open and shut case, just like any other police shooting. It wasn't, though. And six months later, the entire case started to unravel. The Montgomery Advisory was one of the only newspapers to cover this case extensively and alleges that the gun was planted. And many locals were starting to question the events. The police alleged that the paper was making up stories, and the publisher even agreed to take a polygraph test. The publisher of this paper agreed to take a polygraph wow. test. Three Montgomery officers were asked to polygraph, okay? You know what those three officers did? Hmm. They quit. Oh, gosh. They quit. There was no gun at the scene. They shot this man in cold blood and then put a gun there. Yeah. 
And he wasn't even the suspect in that Self robbery. Self-preservation. He wasn't even the suspect in that robbery. So uh, this is applicable to a lot of crimes out there. How did they zero in on him? Right. What caused the police officers to make the assumption that it was him? It's important. And what, what causes police officers today to make that assumption that it is this suspect and not that one? Right. You know? Yeah. So July 2019, another pretty recent one, right? Uh, Deputy Zach Wester in Florida. Have you heard about this? Mm -mm. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Deputy Zach Wester in Florida. Uh, A traffic stop with him would quickly turn to horror. Okay. So what he was doing is he would pull people over. Question them, get them out of the car, and then make up a reason to search the car. He would quickly find drugs, usually always meth, and make an arrest. The people would go into the system. Many saw jail time or lost jobs, lost custody of their children. Yeah. Uh, over several years, Westers seemed to have an uncanny ability to stop cars whose drivers were carrying small amounts of dope. This was an asset for a policeman, and anyone who watched him work uh, was sure he was headed for a promotion. However, every single one was a lie. Over a hundred times, this police officer did this. A hundred times. Why? And we're talking... For a promotion? I I don't know. I don't know. Like, why meth every time? We're talking people, I, and I, I don't know that either. We're talking people who lived normal lives, were upstanding citizens in their communities, had normal jobs like doctors, lawyers, average people getting targeted and pulled over by this police officer in 2019 in Florida and having dope planted on, planted on them. Yes. That's disgusting. Lost kids. That's crazy. Lost dude. all kinds of things That's such, because of this. That is a huge impact from one police officer. Massive. So he ended up getting over 20 years, okay? Eight people were released from prison. Uh, over 100 cases were thrown out. Over another 200 were looked into. And, and uh, this goes to why. What is the point? You are a hindrance on society. You are costing the taxpayers money. You're costing the justice system money. You're costing it time. You're costing it resources. You're not helping. You're making people not trust police officers. Yes, and you're not even making a safer place to live. You're destroying people's lives. You're taking kids away from parents and traumatizing them. Think about people who have never done crime before in their life get pulled over by this guy and get meth have this happen, lose their kids, uh, go to jail or get charged or whatever. Um, and because of that, they lose their job. They turn to a life of crime. Like, I don't think that's that far fetched to make the assumption. And then that you could create happen. a ge- generational issue too. Agreed. So you're making it overall less safe yep so in waukegan illinois in august 1992 a woman called the police and reported that her home had been broken into and her children's 11 year old babysitter holly slacker was missing when police arrived they found the girl's body in the house stabbed to death evidence of um S.A. was found, samples were taken and a massive manhunt began a prison informant Fingered a fellow inmate. Interesting. Prison informant fingered a fellow inmate. Uh, Samples were taken, or uh, Puerto Rican born Juan Rivera. Rivera cooperated from the beginning after he was fingered, was pointed out as being the suspect, um, and gave samples of his blood and DNA. While no physical evidence was found on site linking him to the crime, Rivera was held in custody where his mental condition began to deteriorate. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. His long nightmare was only beginning, too. Rivera was interrogated until he confessed. 
inter- interrogated until he confessed. He was quickly charged with first-degree murder and convicted despite evidence from his electronic ankle monitor showing that he never left home the night of the murder. Gosh. While his first conviction was overturned, his fate was sealed at his second trial by testimony of the child being ba- babysat who was two at the time. They, they came at him again. These are so tragic. So he got this thrown out. The prosecution tried to convict him a third time. What? Yep. That eventually got thrown out. So this was over a 13-year period. Okay? He was incarcerated over a 13-year period, nonstop appeals. And the, uh, the court system had to come out. And make a special ruling saying they were not they were not allowed to pursue prosecution again. Right. So to me, this feels like other areas of our justice system tainted. Why was the prosecution? Yeah, the prosecutor was fighting this corrupt. so hard. Yeah, it feels like it. Right. Twenty ten to twenty eighteen. Uh, wow. Right. The next case is. Um, so Sergeant Wayne Jenkins was a prominent officer in Baltimore. Okay. This is what I was talking about in Baltimore police department, head of the gun trace task force. So when one of his suspects wound up dead, run over by Jenkins car while being arrested, most officers gave him the benefit of the doubt. He claimed that the suspect had pointed a gun at the car. So he ran over his head. The suspect pointed a gun at the car, so he ran over his head. Yep. So it says, this gun turned out to be a BB gun, and that gave him the authority to take out the suspect by any means necessary. But all this started falling apart when Jenkins was arrested and convicted for a host of crimes committed using his position of power, including robberies, dealing drugs, uh, setting up crime scenes and eight others were also included in this eight other police officers eight other police officers were also included in this and not only did that guy who got ran over only have a bb gun he didn't have a gun nothing oh my gosh it was a setup complete and total setup this officer murdered this man (sighs) In That's so last insane. one, last one, then we'll get into some questions. So, 1990s, um, this was essentially almost a whole department. Okay, so mm-hmm. New York State Trooper David L. Harding was an ambitious man, and he was looking to move up from the uh, NYPD to the CIA. When he was asked in an interview if he was willing to break the law for his country, he He didn't wait. He answered yes and proudly announced to the CIA that he had fabricated evidence to convict people he knew was guilty as an officer. The CIA wasn't happy with this answer. They notified the Justice Department and an investigation began. And what they found was shocking. In central New York, a massive conspiracy of fraudulent convictions and falsified evidence had begun taking place for years, it had ruined people's lives. There were at least two false murder convictions. Uh, another man shot and booked uh, falsely. Uh, the police were lifting fingerprints from surfaces in the precinct what? to convict. What? So what they would do is they would bring a suspect into the police, yep. have him touch something, they would lift the fingerprints from there and then submit it as evidence like they took it from the crime scene. Right. That is so messed up. Yeah. It led to, again, another eight being charged and convicted in this system. Dude, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's another video out there, too, <clears throat> of Baltimore. Baltimore, there were a ton of videos on there. And have you seen the one with the Coke can where – and this is really smart, you guys. Like, 
my my hats off for the police officers that do this, okay? Because again, oversight is so important. But when a cop starts their body cam, and there's certain cities that have a rule whenever you're working with a potential suspect or a situation going on and you turn your body cam on. Well, like at the LAPD in Baltimore, when you hit record, it actually saves the previous 30 seconds from before when you hit the button because it's a camera. It's always recording. Oh, okay? okay. Yeah. So it saves the, the 30 seconds before the button is pushed. In L.A., it's two minutes before the button's pushed. But he pushes his button, okay, or he takes – he walks up and there's this lot, finds a Campbell's can – Puts dope in it, crack cocaine in it, and sets it down. Walks back out to the street, turns on his body cam, and you can hear him saying to the guys, oh, I do this all the time. It's no big deal. Turns on his body cam. Well, 30 seconds was enough time to catch him walking up, putting the dope in the Campbell's can, and then walking back out. So then he walks up, checks two or three different things, and then grabs this Campbell's can. He's like, oh, boys, look what I got here. All on camera. Oh my gosh, what a dummy. Yeah. You know what? I'm glad he got caught though. I agree. I agree. I agree. Gross, man. And I think that cameras should be on at all times, and there needs to be rules and regulations about that. I think that cops should be allowed to mute it so here here's an idea let's say cameras are on all the time mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. and they're always audio recording and video recording let's say you're having a fight with your wife right that's not something you want recorded as a police officer you're allowed to answer your phone when you're sitting on the side of the road whatever yeah. so you hit the mute button right you have to mute it not mm-hmm. turn it on then you're then you can do whatever you need to do with your wife and not be recorded not be listened to but as soon as you're done you know it turns back on or let's say it automatically starts recording audio again after 5 minutes or something like that um and then when they pull that footage you you need to write down like hey i muted it at this time for for this reason. Oh, okay, Phone yeah. Phone call with my wife. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think there's some real possibilities around something like that. Yeah, I think there's ways to do it without it being overly invasive. It's just the thing is, is like when you're a cop, like, and you're on duty serving the public, protecting the public, I think that you just don't have those rights to privacy. I. I, I could just, not agree more. I just yeah. don't think you do. Um, now, a conversation with your wife and it's private, maybe the police officer could call in and say, hey, I, I'm parked, you know, here. I, I need to, can you just, you know, set up approval for me to turn my body cam off for five minutes so I can call my wife. We need to have a conversation. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, and the thing is, is if, if, there's a Freedom of Information Act request to get that body cam. They can redact those parts they can. before sending it out. Yeah, I agree. I agree 100%. I think there needs to be more oversight, not less. Agreed. I don't, I don't believe in police privacy. I do not believe in that. Not Me as either. long as you're clocked in. Not as long as you have a badge on your hip or you're around your neck. I do do not believe you should be allowed to have privacy. You are there to do a job and you're there to uphold the laws that we've voted in or have voted our politicians to vote in um, or whatever, right? But you're there as a public servant. You're there to serve the people and the public and we own that position. And, you know, it's really a shame when cops abuse this right because – Police officers have a lot of power. They are given a lot of power. That badge has a lot of weight. We have yeah. covered so many different things here when going down the rabbit hole of the Idaho 4 and looking at every piece of evidence. What they're allowed to do around private information, what they're allowed to gain, the warrants they're allowed to get, uh, sitting outside people's houses, which would be considered stock. Like, that's a lot of power. You're right. And and to have somebody disrespect that power and badge and uh, public service is disgusting. 
despicable. It should be hated more than it is right now. Absolutely. Um, Think of Dr. Moore. Yeah, dude, exactly. The Dr. Moore case that, I mean, that is a big deal for me in the Idaho 4 case. And I don't know why it's not a bigger deal for other people. Knowing there are Idaho state police officers involved in this investigation who literally straight up, without a doubt, framed a man. Yep. They framed him. He was a chiropractor. He was a family man. He was a citizen of that area, like a good citizen, like he, a good Samaritan, I guess you could say. Like he was just an older, he was just trying to live his good life, person, dude. living his life. Yeah, with and his he, family. Yes, and he even had and they like, framed him for no reason. Right. He even had like what you would a lot of people would consider protections around him. His best friend was the uh, voted in corner, whatever, uh, which is a public service position. Elected position. Or elected position. I'm sorry, you're right. Um, And the police went to him and threatened him not to give a statement. And these are the police that are involved in the Idaho Four. So, Look, I, I want to make a connection and statement here. For people that are watching this that believe Brian Koberger is guilty and is on that guilty train, I do not think it's fair when people question the validity of this investigation and or case and or officers for people that believe he's guilty to attack those people and put them down. Because when I went looking here, and I don't have an opinion, I'm not... We've said this a million times. I am not fighting for Brian Koberger to be guilty. I don't care. I care about the investigation, which will fix whether we find out if Koberger is guilty or not. That's just not step one. Koberger is the last step, which we will know if we can validate and verify the investigation is done right and then prove his innocence or guilt, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that I don't care about him as a person. It's just not the most important step right now. Looking into the investigation is. Um, Yeah, it's not like we want him to be... You know what I mean? Like exactly. another victim. Exactly. Um, so I don't want that. I, I absolutely don't want that. I don't I want, want that either. Him to have been the guy. He, he. I hope he is the guy, and I hope that they can prove that he's the guy and that they didn't do anything. Because if they can find corruption in this, that they planted something or lied about something, you could get the whole case dismissed, and then you have a quadruple murderer on the streets. Yeah, and yes, that that's what I was going to also, is that you, I don't think it's fair to put people down or call people out or, or devalue their opinion. When, if you think he's guilty and you're talking or communicating with someone that believes he's innocent and believes there is police corruption or believes that they staged the sheath or believes that they... Uh, had DNA from some other contact or interaction with the law enforcement and they made it look like it was on the sheath. Like these are all very real questions and concerns about people who believe he's innocent or believe there's some something funky here, okay? And those are real questions that have real valid possibilities based on the information that we just pulled here. And I'm not willing to jump on that, but that doesn't make somebody else's concerns more or less valid. Yeah. It needs to be talked about. Yeah, it We can't be. pretend these things don't happen. We can't say, hey, police deserve us to always blind faith trust them. Mm-hmm. No way, dude. No. No way. I do give police... They need police to verify. A- agreed. And I do give police my trust and faith until... I see a crack and then I don't trust nothing and I will go out of my way to go look to see if there's more. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know as, as a woman, I wouldn't necessarily trust the police officer. Like say you get pulled over and you're on like a a dark road in an isolated area and you get pulled over by a cop. I ain't trusting them. No, I would, if you're a woman, I would call in and say, Hey, can you verify you have an officer here at this road? And can you verify this is an officer behind me? Exactly. And they'll literally call the officer on the radio and tell him not to get out of the car until they can verify Yep. So, and you actually, if you're being lit up at night, you can not pull over. A cop, just stay at the, the right speed limit and, and call in 
while driving so that you're not pulled over and at risk and verify it's a cop behind you before you even pull over at all. Yeah. And you're allowed to do that. They would they are not allowed to charge you with that. So for not pulling over until you verified, as long as it's within reason, you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. So while I was doing investigations. That's a good suggestion, though. Yeah. While while I was doing investigations into these topics and into these details, trying to understand uh People's beliefs out there that believe for sure the cops are dirty in this situation. I came across a video, and it's a video of uh, defense attorneys and prosecutors talking about when they know evidence is dirty, when they can tell oh, evidence is guilty. Okay. And it's really interesting stuff. It is interesting. Um, and I might post it here. Let's take a listen here to Dean Strang, who's one of the defense attorneys in Making a Murderer. I didn't see them plant evidence with my, my own two eyes. I didn't see it. But do I understand how human beings might be tempted to plant evidence? After Stephen's exoneration of the lawsuit of the Avery Commission, of the governor hugging Stephen and holding him up as an example of the criminal justice system gone wrong, do I have any difficulty understanding what human emotions might have driven police officers to want to augment or confirm their beliefs that he must have killed Theresa Halbach. I don't have any difficulty understanding those human emotions at all. But they talk about in there, and I, I, I was thrilled to hear this because they say it can be so uncomfortable when you're a prosecutor and you can tell that evidence is staged and yeah. something's not right here. And you don't, as the prosecutor, you don't have evidence proving it was staged but based on your experience you can tell it's staged it puts you in a really uncomfortable situation i bet and that is what we're talking about when we bring up the questions and concerns that does bill thompson even know yep plausible mm -hmm. deniability exactly yep. and wondering if something's fishy here is not the same as having proof that <sighs> something is fishy here yeah if that's the case, I would I expect that's that's a problem that I have is that prosecutors aren't really supposed to have this buddy buddy relationship with police. They're not supposed to. Um, they're supposed to be working for the people um, and get to justice for victims. And, you know, like it's not supposed to be the way that it seems to be. Yeah. Currently, um, I think a prosecutor, if they can see that it looks like some evidence might be planted they should be able to launch an investigation if they have that ability and i think they should be able to have that ability which i think, I think they do they just don't do it because they're buddy buddy with cops i agree with you i agree with you and that's another argument into the difference between staying objective objective or, or subjective because when you get personal relationships it's impossible it's not it's not hard. It's literally impossible to stay objective when you have a personal relationship built into the work yeah. around your officers with a, a district attorney, whatever, the working relationship and the work product. Yeah. It throws objectivity out like, the window. Like instead of doing an investigation because you know there's red flags here and it really looks like something was planted and you know having some kind of third party investigation instead you could go to the police officers and be like hey this isn't looking too good you need to fix this yeah for them to like better set it up yeah i know uh, like it's one crazy. instance that comes to my mind is delphi with the leaks and the fact that the prosecutor along with the law enforcement are investigating this and are trying like it it's all it's all convoluted but yeah i mean that that bothers me that these investigators that have richard allen pinned as the guy are also investigating this and that the prosecutor yeah. is investigating the defense team yep that's not it. okay to me. I, I agree with you. I don't think it's okay either. It is too much overlap. Um, and again, that, that creates a situation where you can't be objective. So, you know, we're just going to shoot it 
straight here with the Dr. Moore stuff in the Idaho 4 case. And, you know, the Dr. Moore has two very important officers in it that were uh, key players in setting up Dr. Moore. And what they did to set him up was alter and manipulate timestamps on videos to make it look like he was at the scene of the crime when he wasn't. Uh, they also ignored his rights when he asked for an attorney and a lawyer like present. Like eight times. More than that. That's eight very clear times, but there's more even after that. But yes, you're right, 100%. Um, and they lied to him and were making deals that police aren't allowed to make, that only the prosecutor's allowed to make, where they were like, hey, if yeah, you just yeah. admit that you did this, even though Dr. Moore didn't, if you just admit you did this, uh, we'll make sure that you're not going to get the death penalty. You'll just get murdered too, you know, but you'll have your life. Um, and they put him in distress so long until uh, this normal stand-up everyday citizen couldn't handle it and, and admitted to guilt, you know, when yeah. he wasn't guilty. Obviously, he, he had an eyewitness alibi, which was the coroner. During right. that time. And there was also eyewitnesses of the shooter that di didn't even match his skin color, hair color, height, weight, nothing. Yeah, and the truck wasn't his. Like, it was it was straight up fabricated. And these cops ignored that. And these cops were key players in the Idaho 4 investigation. Yeah. So, I understand... I'm not saying this is what I believe, but I understand when people are bringing up the question around the validity of this investigation, when they're bringing up the, the questions and insecurities around the officers involved in this investigation, the possibility hmm. of the, sh the sheath being uh, staged or DNA being planted or uh, stretching of the triangulation or any of these things like – I get it. I also believe it's possible Brian Koberger is guilty. And I hope he is guilty. And I hope that there's no misconduct, police misconduct here. Because if he's guilty and there's misconduct, then he gets out and we have a killer on the streets. If he's innocent and there's misconduct, then the killer's already out on the streets. There's no winning. Right. There, there isn't. is none. There isn't. There no. isn't. Mm. And, and a really... A really crappy part of being the good guys is sometimes being the good guys causes you to not get your suspect. It causes you to lose, yeah. You're going to lose sometimes, mm -hmm. but but the people will trust you. Right. The people and, will stand right. with you as police officers. And if you make it okay in one situation, you're making it okay in others, and in those other situations, you might be framing an innocent man. Yeah. But So... I'm really curious what you guys think. Uh, this was really eye-opening for me. I, I didn't expect to find this much evidence this easily, an overabundance of evidence right. where I had to make sure all of it was only from the U.S. and from a certain time frame and, like, from different areas. I mean, it was an endless amount of evidence, um, good, solid video evidence. So I, I get it. I understand it. I'm not willing to go there in the Idaho 4 case until I see definitive evidence, but I understand the connections, and I'm totally willing to accept this could have happened. Yeah. You mean with the local police department? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I but agree with you. Let me know what you guys think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>